everybody and welcome to this week's Tea with Jesus. Um, we're going to be continuing to go into Philippians and there um, I think we'll, we'll once again just back up a tiny bit um, to go back to a little bit of the scripture that was ahead of time, ahead of what we're doing today and kind of you know connect it all together. Um, so it has been an incredibly beautiful cold fall day and uh, I'm just enjoying it. I, it amazes me how that every year we have all the beautiful leaves and then I don't know the moment when it happens but all of a sudden I look around and realize they've all fallen off the trees and it starts to look like winter and um, so I think it's still beautiful. We've had a very blue sky and it's just really lovely today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start reading in Philippians 2. This is the New King James Version. I sometimes use the NAS also the New American Standard or the NIV, the New International Version, but this is the um, the New King James Version. It's just a Bible that I have that has nice big words in it, and um, so that's the one that I'm going to be using. I'm going to start actually at the beginning of the chapter um, and just reread the first 11 verses, and then we're going to continue on um, and probably today finish the rest of the chapter. Um, I think we're going to find that this is a part of his letter to the church at Philippi that you can tell it's really a real letter to real people because he talks about um, some friends and just talks about some things that are going on um, as well as really sharing truth from the Lord that they really need to hear. And um, to me it makes it feel very real that he's just talking about specific friends that he really cares about. So Philippians 2, 1. And um, I'm going to go ahead and just keep reading, probably at this point, all the way through the chapter, and then we'll be talking about some various things. Now, um, he's been talking about the fact that there's persecution. So, in verse 1 of chapter 2, Therefore, um, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God because he is God but making but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross we'll go on into verse 9 Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth. Oh my goodness, that's, that's just amazing when you think about what he's saying there. Every knee should bow. And then verse 11, And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And that's where we um, finished last week, talking about truly honoring Christ for the incredible sacrifice that he made as God the Son to come and to die for us and to give his life as a ransom for many. So let's go now into verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. We're going to be coming back to that very important verse. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. And yet, if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. 
for the same reason you also same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me we are going to definitely come back to these verses because I think it's the crux of the real message that I want to share out of Philippians today. But I want to go ahead now and, like I said, just share um, some of the part of his letter here where he's talking about um, two people, um, Timothy and Epaphroditus, because he's writing to real people. And this is a real letter. He says in verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may also may be encouraged when I know your state. He wants to send Timothy, who has been kind of like a son to him. He's, he's accompanied Paul quite a bit and stayed with him, and Paul has been teaching him and mentoring him and kind of raising him up um, in really wonderful ways. He says, For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. He trusts Timothy to see how they're doing. Verse 21, For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his, Timothy's, proven character, that as a son with his father he served with me in the gospel. Therefore I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. And you realize that he is... Uh, imprisoned in Rome. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. He really wants to see them. Yet I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost sent to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So he's expressing tremendous gratitude that Epaphroditus was able to recover from apparently extremely serious illness. Therefore I send him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So he's just sharing with them um, how grateful he's been to have Epaphroditus, who was apparently really helping to care for things for Paul, but then also had become very, very sick. And so he loves these people in Philippi, and he's thrilled that he can send Epaphroditus to them so that they can see that he's okay. And he just wants, he wants to know that they are doing all right and that they can be reassured by seeing Epaphroditus again. And then he's sending Timothy, whom he tr tremendously trusts, just to check on them and see how things are going because he is, of course, not able to go anywhere at this time. So I think that's really, just really neat there. Um, you know, starting with verse 19 through verse 30 in Philippians 2, that he's just talking to real people about f mutual friends and brothers in Christ that he's very thrilled to be able to send to them. Now, I would like to go back to verse 12 and to verse 13. Um, I think, I, if I think about it, I can remember times in my life where I struggled with really obeying what the Lord really wanted me to do. And I can remember praying even when I was a lot younger, Lord, I'm willing for you to help me be willing. I mean, sometimes I think if we can offer him any amount of obedience, he'll bring his grace and strength into that, even if it helps us to become more willing um, to just obey him and to do what he wants, even when it feels like it's hard. Um, and so I, I really think that... Um, there's been times when I've just really felt like, God, I can't even be willing on my own. You're going to have to help me. And my husband says something, Bill says something that's really, really wise, um, that at any point that we obey God, He reveals more truth to us. And the more truth we know, the more we're able to obey. And so truth and obedience, you know, truth and light being shed in our lives as we obey Him is like this great spiral going upward. Whereas whenever we choose to disobey him, then we start becoming deceived. 
And the more we disobey, the more deceived we become. And the more deceived we become, the more we're liable to be disobedient. And that spiral will go downward. And so um, I think it's really cool when we talk about our willingness to obey, that we look at verses 12 and 13. And I want to take a second as we look at this to talk about the fear of the Lord. Um, I think a lot of times we don't really grasp what that is. There is a difference between being terrified of something and shrinking from it and having an awe-filled, tremendous respect for someone. To know that God is God and He could just blink and we just could be completely destroyed. Um, he's a big, powerful God, a very holy God. And so the more we know Him, I think the more we can have the healthy, genuine fear of the Lord, which is an, an awe-filled respect but not shrinking away and being terrified. And um, I want to just go ahead and, and to say these two verses um, and then share about a little thing. Um, anyway, therefore, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Um, get to know God. Treat this seriously. Realize that this is such an important thing and he's proud of them that they've continued to grow even when they didn't have him there to guide them and to really help them get established anymore and then it says verse 13 for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure and I, I love how that says that um, let's see if the I'm going to go into the NAS real quick this is my little one which fits in my purse, but it's got really little words, um, which are not as easy for me to read anymore, but it works having it in my purse. Um, so let's go to, yeah, it says in the NAS, the New American Standard, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Yep, that's just a very good translation of that. Um, it's neat because God works in us to not only help us to do what he wants us to do, but to be willing and to have that desire. Um, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Um, he will grant us the desires of our heart. And I really think that, that he is at work in us to help us just to take the tiny little mustard seed of faith, that little choice to obey, and to give us the ability to be very willing, joyfully willing, to want to do what he asks us to do. And um, I just think that's a wonderful scripture. In verse 13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That's wonderful. I don't know how many of you have read The Chronicles of Narnia. I love C.S. Lewis's books. There's a tremendous amount of truth about the Lord that is just put into these stories. They're like allegories. Now Jesus used to also tell allegories. He called them parables. And that's where he would tell a story that would illustrate a really amazing truth. Like the prodigal son or the, uh, the shepherd who leaves his ninety and nine to go seek the one who is lost. Well, C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia have a lot of the truth about God that are within the stories. And one of my favorite places in it is one of the best illustrations of the fear of the Lord that I have come across in a story. And that is in a, one of the books called A Horse and His Boy. And these horses can talk because they're from Narnia, but they've been captured and they've been sl enslaved in another country. And um, they get away, and they get away bringing a couple of humans with them. That's why it's not the boy and his horse, it's the horse and his boy. But they're bringing some humans with them. And um, at one point, um, you know, Aslan is their lord and king. He's a lion. And um, he is the son of the great emperor over the sea. He's the one who spoke all, the, all of Narnia into existence. It's Jesus. In fact, in the first story, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, he gives his life for them 
and is resurrected. So it's really cool. But anyway, they get to a place where they're in, finally in some sanctuary, and the big war horse, um, who's had this little boy coming along with him, and then there's this like this beautiful little mare, and um, she's had a girl who's from the, the other kingdom that she's brought with her. Anyway, they're talking, and finally the little girl who's not from the Narnian area, she says, you keep talking about Aslan. You know, I mean, I thought you were really afraid of lions, because... The war horse is really afraid of lions. And he says, I thought you were really afraid of lions. I mean, isn't Aslan a lion? And Bree, the war horse, starts to laugh. And he goes, well, no, not a real lion. I mean, if he was a real lion, he'd be a beast like us. And he's laughing about that. And all of a sudden, everybody's eyes get big. Because behind them, this monstrous, glowingly gorgeous, huge lion has just jumped into the enclosure that they're in. And he's as big as an elephant and shining like the sun. And they're all like staring at him. And Bree, the big tough war horse, is like, what? What's going on? Well, he turns around, takes one look at Aslan, and just bolts, just running as hard as he can. But the little mare, trembling with her knees knocking, goes up to the great lion. And of course, she spent all of her life in captivity. She goes up to this great lion and she says, Sir, I don't know who you are, but I would rather be eaten by you than fed by the hand of anyone else. And he bent his great head down and gave her the mighty kiss of a lion right on her head. <laughs> and he said, Oh, my daughter, I knew you would not be long in coming to me. She had great reason to be terrified of him, but she also knew that she could trust him and that he may not be a tame lion, but he's a good one, and that she was safe. And all he showed her was his love. And to me, when we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, the fear of the Lord, which the Bible says is the beginning of wisdom, it's understanding that his very brightness could squash us like a fly. But when we look into his face, all we're going to see is love. And it's the love that he has for us that caused him to make such incredible sacrifices for us. The love that he never stops having for us. And the love that makes him great and mighty and fearful, but safe. And he wants to be with us. And he wants to give us the mighty kiss of a king. For it is God who is working us, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. I think that's wonderful. And then I want to go on just talking a little bit about um, 14, 15, 16, and into 17. Of course, do all things in verse 14 without complaining and disputing. That's just another good, good idea. <laughs> um, complaining accomplishes nothing and... It keeps us from seeing things with God's truth on it and to know that we don't have to complain. We're in a situation that no matter how it looks, we can be okay because the Lord is still God. He's still king. So that, you know, he says, do all things without complaining and disputing, verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. And yes, if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. And verse 18, for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Paul's life is being poured out for all of these people that he loves. He wants them to know Christ. He wants them to know the hope of salvation and what it means to live with the Lord and walk with him. Paul lived with the Lord and walked with him, and he knew that that's what could be there for all of these people he cared about. And Paul is pouring his life out. He will be killed for the sake of Christ. One of the letters to Timothy is the last letter he wrote before his life was taken. 
But here he's saying, I want you to be blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. I think that sounds an awful lot like our world today. We want to be blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, so that we can shine as lights in the world, because this world is getting into more and more darkness and desperately needs the light of the love of Christ, of the love that we can bring and of the truth that we can bring into everyone around us, that they can see it in our life. Holding fast, hanging on to the word of life, to knowing the truth of what Jesus has done for us and what he wants to do for them. And to, that he said that he could rejoice in the day of Christ. We can trust the Lord. That he will give us the ability to be loving and blameless in the midst of an increasingly evil world. The Bible says, I know whom I've believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And whether our life ends because we die, or it ends because Jesus returns, he will be faithful to us, and we need to stand faithful to him. And so I think out of this section, with all the different wonderful things that are in here, there's two things that really stand out to me. One is that God will help us to be willing as well as able to do his, the things that will give him good pleasure and that we can be blameless and harmless in the midst of this perverse and crooked generation. That we can show love when it seems impossible. That we can forgive the unforgivable. That we can stand strong and trust the Lord to take care of us and not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So I don't think our world is that much different than it was back there with them. And for a lot of people in the world today, they're already having to stand strong under persecution that we've really just never had to experience as of yet in our lives. This is Abba's book. For anybody that's not aware of it, when I'm praying or spending time with the Lord, I really try to write down this is all that's in this one particular journal. It's just things that I really feel like the Lord was speaking to me. And I write it down. And um, I, every now and then I just feel like there's some part of it the Lord wants me to share with you. Because whatever truth he shares, you know, like Paul's letters to these churches, that truth is good for us today. And this is not scripture. This Abba's book. I would never presume to say that it's scripture like God's word is. But I do know that God at times has really spoken to my heart. And if there's any way that the words that have really ministered to me can minister to you, I want to be able to share them. Um, we were just talking in here about that we live in a crooked and perverse generation. And one of the things that I think we've got to understand is that we have an enemy and even though God is hugely greater and he is completely sovereign and victorious and he is we are in warfare and we do have an enemy and one of the things that God was speaking to me out of this particular time that I've written down in Abba's book was to help me to understand um, that Yes, there's times when I just simply disobey because I'm being stubborn or being rebellious. But I also need to recognize that there may be times when I need to stand against the enemy and say, no, I'm not putting up with this. And it's not me that's telling him to get lost. It's who's in me and with me. And <laughs> we've talked before about an illustration of a little bear cub who's out wandering around because you know mama bears we live around a lot of bears around here and mother bears will let their child kind of wander a little farther away from them to get more independent but mama bears watching the whole time but this little cub is out wandering around and he's starting to feel like he's pretty tough stuff and he's right you know he's a little strong tough little cub 
and as he's snooping around and playing, all of a sudden he realizes that in front of him, he sees a wolf. And the wolf is crouched down quietly and creeping toward him quite silently. And he starts to back up, and then he looks over, and the way wolves usually work, they are in packs. And he realizes he has them coming in from the sides, too. He's just this isolated little bear cub. And so he gets very tough. And he's like, oh, I'm going to scare him off. And these wolves are creeping in closer and closer. And he rears up on his little hind legs and, and shows his little claws. And he's all tough. And, he's, of course, he's totally petrified. But he's all tough. And he's... And, and all of a sudden, he realizes that the, the wolves have just stopped. And they're, like, crouched. And they're slinking very quietly away. And that little cub's like, ah, cool. I scared him off. <laughs> well, you know, of course, what happened. Right behind the baby is a very, very big mama. And any time we feel like we need to be afraid of anything the enemy can do, there's nothing that we can do to deal with him. But he will run at the presence, the blood, the name of Jesus. He may laugh when we try to be all big and tough, but he trembles and it shakes the very foundations of hell when we fall on our knees and we reach out to our God, when we choose to forgive, when we choose to love, even when it doesn't make sense. That is kicking the devil in the kneecaps. And we don't ever have to be afraid because he who is in us, around us and with us, is so much greater than he who is in the world. I'm going to read just this one little section out of Abba's book. You have an enemy. He made himself my enemy long ago. He wants to use you to hurt me. Wake up. Only I can reveal the truth. Do not avoid me when you fail, when you sin, even when you rebel. You don't know what's happening on your own. There will be times when your own choices and your own flesh are leading you and you want it to be all the enemy's fault. But there are many more times when you feel like you are simply failing me and being bad and disobedient and you do not recognize the wiles of the enemy at work. You can rebuke him, but you must submit to me first. In order to submit to me, you have to talk to me. You have to honestly open your heart to me. I know what is happening. I want to show you the truth. I want to shield and protect you. All the forces of darkness flee with frantic haste from my presence. You and I will also deal with your flesh and stubbornness. But you must be with me to reject the enemy's lies and deceptions. He wants to stop what I am doing. You are my child, my own, and I fiercely want to protect you. You are always better off aware of my presence. You must live in my light. You will always be glad you know my truth. Abba. And it's because of his presence in our lives that we know that we can shine as a light blameless and harmless, without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And they need those all around us who don't know him, need him so much. We have a bad enemy. And when people act so badly, I feel like their puppets being jerked around by the enemy. He is the one that I need to be angry at and I need to pray for and love people no matter how much they disagree with me let's pray Lord I thank you that you spoke so clearly through Paul it just amazes me the amount of truth I can find through every single bit of his letters Lord please help us to just listen to you to let you be the king that you are. 
to live our lives with holy fear, but to believe you, that you love us and you want to be with us. Lord, thank you that I know that where I am not with people, you are. So, Lord, for everyone listening to this and watching, please, Lord, you know the needs they have in their life, and I want to pray for them again. I want to pray, Lord, that they will allow you to be in the midst of everything they're struggling with, and that, Lord, that they can live in peace that passes understanding. I do want to continue to pray for Starry, Lord. I know they're talking about operating on her neck again. God, please just continue to strengthen her and be with her. You've been working miracles. And Lord, I, I don't know every need that's out there, but I'm so glad you do. And so I trust that your word is going to just sink into people's hearts and they're going to see who you are. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Love you guys. And thank you for sharing this time with me. And I really want to encourage you to really be reading Philippians for yourself. And um, it just amazes me that I'm able to share his word with all of you. Oh my goodness, what a privilege. So, all right, thank you. And we'll do some more music soon. And um, I will see you later.